This is a real case study detailing a disease that has caused real pain and suffering in our subject's life and family. We ask that you kindly respect the views and opinions of our subject's family and friends as they help tell her story. Since the interviewing stage was after our subject's surgery, we respected her recovery and did not make her interview at that time. Also, due to her decline in speech from her condition, we respected her integrity and did not pressure her to interview afterwards. Thank you for understanding. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday dear Catherine Magnus. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Happy birthday, guys. <laughs> I think knowing how Catherine was before this all happened, it makes it um, a lot worse to go through, mm -hmm. knowing that she was um, so active and healthy and I guess I hate watching her have to go through it and you know, no one wants to have that happen to them. Before she got sick, she was a normal baby. She hit all her milestones on time. Um, she was very active in sports, always running around and just a normal Before child. Before Catherine um, got sick, she was really good at sports and um, played in many different sports. She loved riding horses and at one point had her own horse. She never sat down. She was always running around and doing different things. and. Um, spending a lot of time reading and being involved in school and doing very well in school. Um, just happy and go lucky and a normal kid. I think I first noticed it when she was in sixth grade. Um, she was playing softball a lot and she was complaining her legs hurt and I just thought it was, she played catcher and I just thought it was too much. Um, of playing catcher and maybe in that catching position was making her legs hurt more. And slowly we noticed other things start to happen. She was getting tired and struggling to stay awake before anything of the more, more of the true physical symptoms. Um, I'm pretty sure that's how it all started. I can remember the penmanship <coughs> uh, being all of a sudden they thought the penmanship had deteriorated and was a it was harder to read. That was one of the first things I remember. And I just remember Allie sharing stories that she had, like was passing out. She had passed out at a couple of the concerts early on, early on, and then, um, but they never really could attribute it. It didn't seem to anything. And then she started to hold her hand still, and uh, so it was kind of hard for her to play sometimes. Um, sports were getting difficult, so it was like this progressive losing her, her mobility and her... After two years of intensively searching for answers and medications to help control Catherine's symptoms, she was given the diagnosis of rapid onset dystonia with Parkinsonism. This disease is very rare, presenting itself mostly in adolescence or young adulthood over a course of days or months, during which the patient develops spasms or muscle cramps that eventually leave them unable to walk or balance effectively. Some sort of physical or emotional stress usually triggers it, and the symptoms stay about the same intensity level as they were when the disease first starts. However, it can be worsened by a second episode, which can arise years after the original onset. The condition starts at the top of the body, in the facial muscles, making it difficult to talk and swallow, and works its way down into the arms, and eventually the legs. Looking at the problems that arise with neurons help to get a better understanding of how DBS works. In the substantia nigra, nerve cells produce dopamine, a neurotransmitter responsible for relaying messages that involve the planning and controlling of body movements. 
Parkinson disease occurs when those nerve cells die off, causing a drastic decrease in dopamine. The nigrostriata pathway is a neural pathway connecting the substantia nigra with the striatum. The movement of impulses are carried in a smooth manner due to the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. This information travels around in the substantia nigra basal ganglia circuit in long loop feedback pathways before leaving the brain. When these pathways are disrupted, tremor and dystonia may occur. Parts of the basal ganglia can either become over or under stimulated when the dopamine receptors in the striatum are not sufficiently stimulated. The subthalamic nucleus becomes overactive and causes failure of the globus pallidus pars interna. This inhibits motion and causes rigidity. When the globus pallidus interna is overstimulated, thalamic output decreases and causes tremor. Tremor and stiffness of muscles occurs when messages cannot be transferred due to the lack of dopamine. Glutamate, in high levels, also appears in the substantia nigra of patients with Parkinson's due to the hypothesis that there is a great decrease in mitochondria function and succeeding alterations in the circuit. This is a positive feedback loop. These high levels of glutamate cause excitotoxicity, resulting in damage and killing dopaminergic neurons. Some medications, such as levodopa, have been seen to help with tremors by being converted by enzymes in the brain to produce dopamine. Symmetrol, known as amantadine, also works to block the action of glutamate, allowing an increase of dopamine. In some patients, like Catherine, medications may wear off before a next dose can be consumed, sometimes causing intolerable side effects. The use of medications was also a frustrating one for Catherine because her symptoms were not improving. Her ability to communicate and walk continued to decline. When medications do not show results, deep brain stimulation is often considered. The muscle contractures. Um, she takes Parkinson's medicine. We started on Cinnamint, um, which is levodopa carbidopa. We moved on to um, Mirapex, and then the last one we took was Requip. Um, and then she's also tried different um, medicines that help kind of combat the side effects of some of the Parkinson's medicines. But the side effects of those um, medicines um, kind of outweighed their benefits, so we didn't what take What makes those medication too difficult? Long. She has a difficult time swallowing, and the medication that she takes is all in pill form, so sometimes it's really hard for her to get the medications down. We usually crush it up and um, put it in applesauce. That usually seems to be about the best. I happen to be watching today's show. Dr. Nancy Snyderman talked about this doctor in Boston that was doing great things with uh, people with things like Catherine had. And one of the things that he was doing was deep brain stimulation. About one of Allie's friends. And he asked if they had tried that. And I said, I have no idea. I said, I had no idea. He hadn't done surgery. And, you know, that's all I, and stuff. He, um, he actually came from Harvard, so he had obviously heard some of this and that type of thing. And he works down in Chicago from one of the hospitals down there. So I didn't realize that's what it was called, but he did talk about the surgery and that type of thing. The electrode's small fine tip is implanted deep into the region of the brain associated with the disease symptoms. The surface of the electrode uses four metal pads to transmit small pulses of electricity to the desired area. The neurostimulator is a small device implanted under the skin near the patient's chest. This is where electrical signals sent to the electrode are generated. The electrical patterns are quick pulses at a high frequency, usually 100 times per second. The extension is an insulated cable which carries the electrical current from the stimulator to the electrode. To decrease risk of infection, the extension follows a small tunneled path under the skin. 
The patient's programmer is a handheld device that uses a magnet to send signals to the stimulator. This allows patients to control the doses of electrical currents to fit their specific needs within the range prescribed by. The basal ganglia is a group of brain structures that work together to help control body motions. When any part of the basal ganglia is impaired, the normal flow of information is altered. Widespread movement control problems are often the result, as in the case of Parkinson's disease. The purpose of an implanted DBS electrode in this region is to counteract abnormal brain activity by altering it in a way that decreases the disease symptoms. An electrode targets one of several possible structures within the basal ganglia. For Parkinson's disease, this is most commonly the subthalamic nucleus because it greatly influences other areas of the basal ganglia. A deep brain stimulation electrode is implanted into the subthalamic nucleus and sends out pulses of electricity, ultimately altering all of the brain activity normally affected. Although experts have not exactly pinpointed the mechanism in which DBS influences the brain, some of their theories include the following. The quick pulses of electrical current emitted by the electrode may block irregular brain activities, closing the pathway of corrupted information. Another theory believes that the electrical pulses take the place of irregular activities by producing a signal to drown out the abnormal patterns. Because not everyone's brain is shaped the same, the task of locating and accessing a specific brain structure without disturbing the surrounding areas is one of the most challenging goals for a surgeon implanting a deep brain stimulation device. One standard tool is a stereotactic frame that holds the patient's head very still giving the doctors a stable starting point to make measurements. The surgeon will also rely on imaging such as MRIs or CT scans to help pinpoint the location of specific structures within the brain. To be sure that the electrode is in the right place, typically the device is turned on to observe its effects on the patient's symptoms. For this reason, the patient is usually kept awake for the implantation portion of surgery. Local anesthesia is required to numb the location where a small hole is made in the skull, but the brain itself has no pain receptors, so the patient won't feel any pain during implantation. After the electrode is in place, if the patient is awake, they are placed under general anesthesia. Next, the surgeon implants the neurostimulator, usually within the patient's chest. Then, a pathway is tunneled under the skin for the extension from the neurostimulator to the electrode in the brain. After surgery, the doctors switch on the deep brain stimulation device and program it to suit the individual needs of the patient. Different aspects of the electrical stimulation pattern, such as pulse strength, shape, and frequency, can be adjusted as necessary. The patient is also required to come in every few months so the doctor can adjust this pattern to ensure optimal performance of the device. This figure, taken from an article by the Department of Psychology at the University of Durham, shows the result of a movement study. In this study, participants were asked to reach as fast as possible for a stationary object. As you can see, three different groups were examined. The control group, which was not inflicted with any movement disorder, and the two groups that had Parkinson's disease. When patients with Parkinson's disease were asked to reach for the stationary object, it took them significantly longer and their movements were slower than the control group. However, it is fascinating to see that once DBS was turned on in the patients with Parkinson's disease, their speed almost doubled while their time was cut in half. This is a great example of the positive effects of deep brain stimulation. Although there are many positive attributes to this treatment, Many ethical and social issues in deep brain stimulation have arisen in the recent past. Primarily, the use of deep brain stimulation is a last resort treatment. Patients only opt to use it when the disorder has claimed a majority of their way of life. Due to this, informed consent may not, in actuality, be completely informed. Patients may not be in complete control of their minds and may not take all of the variables into account. Some believe that this is unjustly immoral. If the patient isn't in complete control of his or her mind, 
he or she should not be allowed to make decisions that could potentially have such a large impact on their lives. This is one of the major points that adversaries of DBS bring up. Deep brain stimulation can, for example, induce a hypomaniac state in patients where some patients refuse adaptation of the stimulator settings because they are not aware of their disturbed mental state. These patients may harm themselves or others. Here, assessment of competence to decide is crucial to determine whether or not the treatment team may change the setting or discontinue treatment without the patient's consent. If an incompetent patient inflicts severe harm on himself or others, some believe that it is ethically justified to intervene. Because of the effects of DBS are reversible, adjustment of settings or discontinuation of stimulation can restore the patient's competence. In this way, the patient can be enabled to make his own autonomous decisions considering the further course of action. The article assigned for today, titled Ethical Issues in Deep Brain Stimulation, discusses the balance between the risks and the benefits. Even though there are risks and complications with deep brain stimulation, such as hemorrhage, infection, lead misplacement or breakage, there are many benefits. For example, there is no purposeful destruction of any part of the brain when probes are put into place. Doctors have the ability to adjust the electrical stimulation based on the patient's response without having to go back into surgery. The stimulator can also be turned off at any time if the patient is having any complications. The video assigned showed a man in the operating room being treated for a movement disorder. He was fully awake while being treated with deep brain stimulation. Before the stimulator was turned on, the man had a severe tremor, shown by him holding a mug unsteadily. Once the electrical current was applied, an immediate response occurred and the man's tremors reduced drastically. This shows that deep brain simulation targets the precise areas in the brain regarding the affected area. Okay, so we started off in the pre-op, they explained the whole surgery to us, and then um, Chuck and I actually both got to go down to the OR with her, and we stayed with her until they put her to sleep, and then we had to leave, and then they, they did the surgery. And I think it took about four hours, about four hours total for the surgery itself. Six hours. Yeah, about six hours. And then she was about an hour in recovery too, and then we got to go down there and um, see her after the surgery. And about an hour after that, then they brought her back to her room. I guess I was just hoping that things would go well. I wasn't, I surprisingly wasn't like overly nervous, at least I don't think I was, because um, I really trusted that the doctors that she had, that they knew, that they know what they're doing. Um, it was taking a long time, <laughs> which we knew. Um, I guess too, another thing that I was thinking during, while she was in there was what should we expect? Well, like, I know. guess I felt confident in her surgeon and in, in the staff, and I, I really wasn't worried. I, you know, I thought that she was in the best possible um, facility to have that type of an operation done. And, um, so I guess I wasn't scared or anything. I was just more hopeful that the results would be good and positive. And, it would make give her a better life, make her happy. I guess I was just a little bit nervous. Um, you know, they have to explain the side effects of the surgery or things that could happen when she's in surgery. And so that's kind of scary, but um, I think you try to push that to the back of your mind and you try to focus on how this is going to help her down the road. The day of the surgery, she was actually very calm. All the surgeons and the um, anesthesiologist and the nurses down there were just kind of amazed at how calm she was about the whole thing. Um, I think she kind of freaked out the, about a week or two before the surgery. Um, but other than that, we just kind of talked her through it and... Uh, I don't know, that's really about the only time she got nervous about it. 
Our group decided to take a consequentialist approach to this ethical question. From Catherine's story, we feel that deep brain stimulation was the right decision because the outcomes have been positive thus far. As we learned earlier in the semester, beneficence, abstaining from actions that aim to harm, is a top priority for those in the healthcare field. It is of the utmost priority to put the life of the patient first. In this case, DBS was Catherine's last option. After all medications and therapy, deep brain stimulation has proved to be very helpful to Catherine. She's young. Yeah. She has a full life ahead of her. That's what I'm thinking is if there's something that can be done to help her lead just because she's young. Well, I guess I don't think there's anything unethical about it. I guess I don't see how people could think it's unethical. Um, if you live with a person with dystonia or with Parkinson's long enough and you see how it impacts their daily life. I mean, what 17 year old or even somebody that's 30 or 40 or 50 wants someone to feed them or dress them or, you know, shower them. Um, and you see the medicines, you've tried three or four different things and nothing's working. I mean, there's, it's your last hope. You know, it might not work, but still you have to give it a shot. I'm, I mean, you can't, <laughs> I guess I just have a hard time seeing as how people can think something like that would be unethical. I think it, it reiterates something that we always lose sight of, um, to appreciate every day. Um, don't take it for granted, and, you know, it's, it's always easy to look at yourself and feel sorry for yourself and I think in the grand scheme uh, when something goes wrong for you and then you look at the courage that Catherine has and how she's battling this and dealing with this you know it's pretty hard to ever have those feelings so uh, I think it's it's a reflective piece where you try to make yourself a better person and take every day as, a, as an opportunity to Paying attention to um, when something changes. I mean, regardless if it's medical or if it's you know something going on at home, um, and being um, more more not sympathetic, but just more caring and more um, in tune to them. So. Mm -hmm knowing what I can do to, to help them overcome. I think it's made me more aware of um, other people that have some uh, disabilities too, or serious illnesses. And a lot of families go through a lot of tragic things. Take the little things, you know, there's, you don't take anything for granted anymore. Because before you just thought, Everything is going along just fine, and nothing, you know, nothing's gonna happen. I have these three perfect children, and then, you know, something like this is dropped in your lap, and then you don't take things for granted anymore.